Debbie Gatlin. For years, our family lived in the Charlotte area, and we went to one church in Cornelius for nine years. We loved that church. And once a year, we would do something called the Solemn Assembly, and it was a time where the whole church would pray and fast for about three days. Sometimes it was, was longer, but usually three days. And during that time, they we would take 24-hour periods, and we would have people in the sanctuary, and they would just be praying, and they would be declaring the Word of God. And they had a board upon the platform that was laying there, and it was covered with paper, and people would write all these prayer requests on this board. And we had so many miracles. People prayed. We tried to have people around the clock in that sanctuary praying over those needs and declaring the Word of God, just reading it forth into the airwaves. And in the evening, we would have a service. And those services were so powerful. As people kept praying, you, would, you could feel the power of God getting thicker and thicker and heavier and heavier in, in the building. And so we would come together. And one of those days, we always had something called the healing of the brokenhearted. Our pastor, Pastor Barry Taylor, would do this service, and it was so powerful. I mean, people's hearts would just be healed as he just spoke the word of God. And he would, at the beginning, he would say, Now, if anybody starts weeping beside you, calmly put your hand upon their shoulders and just pray for them quietly. So during the time he was preaching that, sure enough, people were just crying all over the place, and they People around them would put their hands upon them and just pray over them and, and just release the love of God over them. And he started preaching this one part in his sermon about words. And he said, sticks and stones can break our bones, but names will never hurt you. Many of us, we've heard that old nursery rhyme. But the fact is that words do hurt you and they do pierce your heart. And so he went on and just talked about how people had had words spoken over them and they're still believing the lies of those words. And all of a sudden, this woman gets up and she is crying uncontrollably. And she starts crying out and yelling at the top of her voice, I am not stupid! I am not stupid! I am not stupid! <laughs> and she darts out of the building. And uh, Pastor Barry is so calm. He said, ushers, would you bring her back in here? Because Jesus wants to heal her heart and make her whole. So they bring this woman back in. And sure enough, God's there to heal her and make her whole. And all those curses of the words that had been spoken over her, making her think that she was stupid, those things were broken by the power of God. I want you to know that you have been given an incredible gift, the gift of speech. And God says that you have the power to command life and death over people's lives. I love Ezekiel, the 37th chapter. Ezekiel is hanging out with God, and God takes him to a place, a valley that's filled with dry bones. Ezekiel has no idea that those bones were symbols of brokenhearted people, people that had, were full of, of shame, people that had lost hope, people that were dry and weary and beaten down. But God had a remedy for those broken bones, those dry bones that were in that valley. God wanted Ezekiel to speak words of life over those bones. He, God knew that if Ezekiel would speak his words over those bones, that those bones that symbolized those people, that those people would come alive, that they would live again, and that they would become a mighty army. So God tells Ezekiel, can they live? And Ezekiel's like, I don't know. Well, God knows that his word's living. God knows his word's active. God knows his word's powerful. God knows that the grass will wither away and the flowers will fade. But the word of the Lord, it endures forever. So he says, speak, prophesy, prophesy over these dry bones. And Ezekiel did. And he did it twice. But those bones rattled and they shook and they came together and life came back into them. And the Bible said they became a mighty army. God made them whole through the spoken word of God. God wants to speak his life over you. The Bible says in Proverbs, the 18th chapter, life and death are in the power of the tongue. And those that love it, well, they're going to eat the fruit thereof. 
God says there's fruit that comes out of your words. And if you love that, love life, and you speak life over people, then there's this luscious fruit that's going to come forth that's full of nourishment and power and strength. But the same thing, if you speak death, then the fruit of darkness will come into people's lives that you speak over. God wants you to speak life. He wants you to speak life. And he doesn't want you to speak death. Because that, that death that you speak over other people, well, it's seeds of death. And it will also come into your own life. The Bible says that those that love cursing, well, that came to them. God wants you to love life. In Psalm 64, the psalmist is talking about wicked people gathered together. And he says, hide me, Lord. Hide me from them. And he talks about their tongues. He says their tongues are like sharp swords. And their words are like arrows being shot forth. He can feel the pain of them. Now listen to what it says here. This is Psalm 64, 2. Hide me from the secret counsel of the evildoers, from the turmoil of those who do iniquity, who would sharpen their tongue like a sword. And they aim bitter speech as their arrows to shoot from concealment at the blameless. Suddenly they shoot at them, and they do not fear. In Romans 3.13 it says, Their tongue is an open sepulcher. Talks about our tongue again. It says it's like a grave. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Now the word asp is, a, I looked that up, and the asp is a snake. It's a little snake. And it says that this snake is so deadly, even though it's so little, the snake is so deadly that if it bites you, you're sure to die. And he says, the only hope is that you cut off the poison. Cut off that place where you've been bitten. God says, our tongues can be like swords. They can be like serpents. They can be like arrows being shot forth and piercing our hearts. In James, the fourth chapter, it talks about the tongue. And it talks about how this, this tongue of ours has power to direct our lives. That, and then it compares it like to a horse with a bit in its mouth. How a horse, though it's a great big creature, can be directed by this little bit in its mouth. Then it talks about these boats, these mighty boats that have just a little rudder under the bottom. And yet, yet that little rudder can direct the way the boat goes. God says the tongue is a small part of the body, but it boasts of great things. How great a force to set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. And the tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body. And it sets on fire the course of our life, and it's set on fire by hell. Then it goes on and says, with it we, we bless God, and with it we curse man. See, God says that there's life and death in the power of your tongue. God wants you to choose life this day, to speak life over people, to encourage people. One of my sisters and I were talking about how cruel people could be in junior high and high school and just how cruel their words could be. I told her, I said, I remember one time me walking down the hall and I've got my books in my hand and a guy turns around and he looks at me and says, you're ugly, true twin. And it's like, I didn't even hardly know the guy. And I'm like, man, am I ugly? Am I ugly? My, my sister goes, well, I remember this lady. This lady in homeroom wrote me a note, and she says, it's painful for me to have to turn around and look at you all the time. And she goes, I always thought I was homely, but then I told my mom, I said, I knew it, mom. I knew I was homely. You told me I wasn't, but I knew it. The lies of those words and the pain there's that so many people go through. I, I remember just, just recently I, I was looking at this one guy's Facebook page and I said, Lord, this guy, he's gone through so much and someone just put something cruel to him. And all through high school, he was just beaten down with cruelty and mean words. And then someone posted something else about him. Just mean, just meanness. And I said, Lord, this guy has lived under the weight of people's words his whole life. And he doesn't know how valuable and precious he is to you. God says, you've got life in your words. In Ephesians 4, it says this, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word that is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, that it may give grace to those who hear. God says, hey, 
I want what comes out of your mouth to be wholesome. Unwholesome, well, that's rotten. I don't want any rotten words coming out of your mouth, but I want words that bring life and wholeness and strength. I want you to build up people edification. That means you're building, you're building, you're building, you're making them stronger and stronger. Only such a word is, that is good for the moment. For that moment, you're going to give grace to the person. You're going to give them favor because a lot of them, they've been beaten down. They've been around ungodly people that don't know the power of their words. And God says, I want you to speak grace over them. My kindness, my favor, my goodness, my ability, my strength. You speak it over them. Song of Solomon is about Solomon and his bride, the Shulamite. It's also about Jesus and his bride, the church. In the third chapter, she has grown. The Shulamite, she's leaping upon the mountains. She's following Solomon wherever he goes. And he says to her, says, my beloved, my bride, your lips drip honey. Milk and honey are under your tongue. Honey is a type of revelation. It's God's spirit revealing his word to you. When Jonathan had his sword and he saw some honey and he dipped it into the honey and he tasted the honey, the Bible says his eyes brightened. Milk and honey are under your tongue. God says milk, a symbol of the anointing, the fatness. Fatness breaks the yokes and bondages of hell. God says, I've anointed you. I've anointed you with the sweetness of my revelation. I've anointed you to break yokes and bondages. Through what? Honey's on, his, on her lips. Milk and honey's under her tongue. She's speaking the words of life over people. She's giving grace to people for what they need at that moment. Life and favor, God's goodness is being poured out over them. In 1 Peter, the third chapter, it says this, to sum it all up, let all be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but rather leaving a blessing instead. For you've been called for this very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Let him who means to love life and see good days reframe his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking guile. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him pursue peace. Now, God says, I want your words filled with life, milk and honeys under your tongue. I want you to speak life over people because I've called you to walk in blessing. I've called you to inherit blessing. I've called you to be a person of abundance. In Matthew 12, 34, Jesus is speaking. And he says, we're going to be held accountable for every word that we speak. It says this, listen. For the mouth speaks that which fills the heart. The good man out of his good treasure brings forth what is good. The evil man out of his evil treasure brings forth what is evil. Then it says this, but I tell you, every, every careless word that men speak, they shall render account for it in the day of judgment. For by our words, we're going to be justified, and by our words, we'll be condemned. Jesus says this, hey, every word that we speak, we speak, God's going to hold us accountable for it. Whether we spoke life, whether we spoke destiny over people, whether we spoke encouragement, and even over our own lives, whether we chose to speak over ourselves the things that God has declared in his word, those things that he's declared in, to us in our prayer time, those things that were prophesied over us, whether we chose to embrace that and declare it forth over our life, being like Abraham who, who called those things that are not, though he couldn't see what was happening at the time, though he didn't see a son in his arms, he believed God that his descendants would be as the stars of the sky. He believed God, even though his, his wife's womb was dead and empty, she was in her 90s, almost 100 years old, and him 100 years old, he believed that God was able to make him fruitful and a mighty nation, and God did. Now, I'm going to leave you with a song my husband wrote many years ago about our tongue. It's called Words. So many words we speak to one another. It's so easy to tear down a sister or a brother. From the abundance of our hearts, we speak just what we are. Lord, help us, we pray, to be careful what we say. The Course says, 
So forgive us, Lord, for all the words we've spoken, for every wound and hurt, for every heart we've broken. We don't want to speak wrong or evil about all of your precious people. So forgive us, forgive us for all of our words. We have the power to speak life and we can speak death, to kill or destroy or to heal with our every breath. So may we speak what edifies and may God be glorified so that we might each touch someone with our speech. And again, it says, so forgive us, Lord, for all the words we've spoken, for every wound and hurt, for every heart we've broken. Lord, I don't want to speak wrong and evil about all of your precious people. So forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for all of our words. Now I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to ask God to help us with our words. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking for your help. God, we need your help. Set a guard over our mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the doors of our lips, Lord. Let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord God. You said the mouth speaks that which fills the heart, so fill our hearts with good things. Help us to turn away from evil and do good. Help us to love life, Lord God. And, and your word says we'll see good days when we reframe our tongue from evil. So help us, Lord. Help us to see people as you do. And Lord, to speak your words of life over every situation and every circumstance, whether it's in our life, whether it's in our family, whether it's in our friends, or even over our enemies, you said to bless and not to curse, so help us. Now I pray for those that your hearts have been torn apart because of bitter words that have been spoken over you, from tongues that were like knives and arrows and had the deadly asp, the deadly stink under them. Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, take out the poison, Father God. I cut it off by the authority of Jesus Christ now in the name of Jesus, Lord. And God, I thank you that every arrow, Lord God, that's pierced their hearts, I remove it by the authority of Christ, and I release your healing. I release your life. I thank you for binding up their hearts and making it whole, that every fragment piece is brought back together, Lord. And you are whole now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now you have a wonderful week, and know this, God wants to speak his words of life through you to others. He loves you. God loves you. He loves you. God bless you. Bye-bye.